Greetings, everyone. Welcome to today's Physio TV session. Uh, we have with us Dr. Sajri Joshi. She is currently working as a senior physiotherapist as Fit to Sport. She has a master's in musculoskeletal physiotherapy. She is also a certified kinesio taping practitioner. She has published a research article on progressive neuromuscular training on pain function and balance in patients with knee osteoarthritis in the European Journal of Physical Therapy. We are glad to welcome her because she is our alumni, the alumni of Sanjayati College. Today, we are going to, she's going to speak on neuromuscular training in osteoarthritis. We welcome you, ma'am. Hello. So good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I would really like to thank Physio TV for inviting me for the talk. So I'll begin uh, with the talk. Uh, okay. okay. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes, it's visible. Okay. So we'll begin with the topic that is our uh, neuromuscular training in knee osteoarthritis. So what are what all the things that we are going to look upon today is knee osteoarthritis, its prevalence, risk factors, signs and symptoms. Uh, what is sensory motor system? Uh, what is neuromuscular training? What is the neuromuscular training program and the basics of neuromuscular training research? So now, uh, if we see the prevalence of knee osteoarthritis, there's a recent article from 2020 where they found the global regional prevalence incidence and risk factors of knee osteoarthritis. Uh, so they found that in India, if we see, it's around 22 to 24% prevalent. So out of all the types of osteoarthritis, knee osteoarthritis is highly prevalent in our country. If we look into the regional prevalences, so we have uh, Uttar Pradesh uh, followed by Maharashtra, followed by West Bengal being highly prevalent in knee osteoarthritis. Whereas if we see age-wise uh, population-based uh, prevalence is higher in Goa and Rajasthan and then Kerala. So if we see in our country, that is Maharashtra, we have highest, uh, sorry, uh, in our state, we have highest prevalence of knee osteoarthritis. Now, what are the base, like the causes or etiology of knee osteoarthritis? So there are two major factors or causes of knee osteoarthritis. So the systemic factors or the risk factors for knee osteoarthritis being age, gender, obesity, and genetics. Whereas if we see age, as the age advances, the disease progression advances, the gender uh, being females being more prevalent uh, uh, than males in knee osteoarthritis, having knee osteoarthritis. Obesity is again a major concern, a major risk factor for knee osteoarthritis and hereditary uh, knee osteoarthritis in the family. The mechanical factors which we can control are, say, our muscle weakness, uh, joint loading and joint morphology and alignment. Injury is, again, a major risk factor for knee osteoarthritis. So post-traumatic knee osteoarthritis, which we hear, is the secondary knee osteoarthritis. But how do we control is through the prevention strategies. Post-trauma is how we are going to control this factor of uh, you know, which uh, injury which leads to knee osteoarthritis. Now, what are the other factors that lead to advancement of knee osteoarthritis? So, there are multiple factors which we are looking into. That is proprioceptive acuity, effusion, joint aberrant joint mechanics, motivation, obesity, pain, anxiety, and muscle atrophy. So, now, the major studies that we look into the literature try uh, have focused on working on the muscle atrophy by muscle strengthening programs. But we also need to look into the other factors that lead to the advancement of the knee osteoarthritis and how we are going to work on them. So we'll look into how uh, one by one of these factors lead to 
proprioceptive uh, deficits and how these further lead to aberrant joint mechanics. So now basic, before beginning to what is neuromuscular training, first we need to understand what is the sensory motor system. So now from the word, we understand that whenever there is a sensory input, it's going to give us a motor output. Now these, this sensory motor system basically is defined as where it has sensory components, it has motor components, there is central integration of these uh, sensory and motor components, there is processing component. And if we talk about uh, in the terms of joints, this sensory motor system is going to help us provide joint stability or functional stability. Now, this is a uh, this system is a hierarchical organization. Basically, it involves the association cortex, which incorporates of motor cortex, somatosensory cortex, our parietal cortex. Then we have basal ganglia and cerebellum. And at the lower level, we have these uh, uh, tracts. And at the lowest level, we have muscles. So it's a parallel structure and there is signal flow between the level over multiple parts. So we'll be seeing how this occurs and how uh, this is going to lead to uh, advancement of the diseases. Basically, if there is any dysfunction at any level of this system, it is going to lead to uh, incoordinated uh, muscle action. This incoordinated muscle action is going to compromise the functional stability, hence leading to abnormal loading of the joint and further leading to advancement of the disease. Okay, so we see that it's a hierarchical organization. Sensory input is going to give us motor output and there is always sensory motor learning. In this uh, aspect, we are talking about feet forward feed forward and feedback control mechanisms. So now, uh, what happens when, uh, like one of the mechanism which incorporates the sensory motor system is something called as arthrogenic muscle inhibition. Now, whenever there is joint damage, maybe because of knee surgery, maybe because of ACL ligament injury, or maybe because of knee osteoarthritis, it leads to inflammation, swelling, joint laxity, and receptor damage. Now, how are these going to affect the pathways and uh, it is going to lead to arthrogenic muscle inhibition? We'll be seeing one by one. So what happens is because of swelling and inflammation, the afferent discharges, that is the afferents that are present in our knee joint that is group 2, group 3 and group 4 afferents are going to get stimulated. These are going to inhibit the, uh, so basically stimulation of these afferents is going to increase the excitability or sensitivity of uh, the wide range dynamic neurons that are present which actually cause the central sensitization which we all know so now because of this what happens is there is decreased net inhibition from the brain stem so because of decreased inhibition from the brain stem of the uh, muscle say for example here uh, we take example of the quadriceps muscle inhibition so what happens is whenever there is going to be quadriceps muscle inhibition, there is going to be increased flexion reflex, increased firing of the antagonistic muscles. Second, what happens is because of swelling, joint laxity and inflammation, there is inhibition of 1B fibers. Now, 1B fibers actually help in stimulating the alpha motor neuron. And this alpha motor neuron leads to muscle contraction. Now, if there is increased inhibition of this 1B fibers, it is going to lead to decreased alpha motor neuron excitability, hence leading to decreased quadriceps contraction, which leads to arthrogenic muscle inhibition. Now, if there is decreased quadriceps activation, even if we give strength training protocol, 
the results that we are expecting won't be to the optimum level because the inhibition is from the from the uh, neural structures which are controlling the uh, muscles now we have uh, another uh, dysfunction that is gamma loop dysfunction because of receptor damage now joint damage can lead to the receptor damage that is if we have acl injury leading to ligamentous um, so ligament injury leading to receptor damage or we have knee osteoarthritis so advancement of the uh, disease as the age advances leading to the receptor damage which will further lead to the gamma loop dysfunction now what is the function of this gamma loop basically if we see over here the gamma motor neuron receives the uh, proprioceptive or in or sensory inputs from our articular muscle cutaneous and descending supraspinal pathways this information basically they innervate the muscle spindle so your gamma motor neuron innervates the muscle spindle which gives the signal about the muscle length uh, at particular point of time so this gamma motor neuron is going to provide information and the final common input is going to go to the alpha motor neuron which is going to lead to the excitability of the muscle now if there is receptor damage and if there is gamma loop dysfunction this is again going to lead to decreased alpha motor neuron excitability leading to arthrogenic muscle inhibition so why are we uh, looking into all of this is because alterations at the lower level or the middle level or the supraspinal uh, influences of the sensory motor system is going to affect the muscle contraction or the muscle firing and this is going to lead to further advancement of the disease so that's why working on the sensory motor system is equally important when we are going to treat the patients with knee osteoarthritis so supraspinal centers as we see over here they have alpha motor neuron pool and gamma motor neuron pool these gamma motor neuron pools uh, uh, innervate the muscle spindles and hence give the sensory information to the alpha motor neuron pool which again is going to stimulate our muscles okay so basically this is about basic about the sensory motor system so if there is going to be persistent quadriceps muscle weakness or al so altered firing leading to quadriceps muscle weakness is going to lead to impaired dynamic joint stability so this joint stability is important when we are performing daily life functions so this is going to lead to decreased physical function and quality of life if there is decreased function and quality of life there is risk of re injury also increases if there is altered muscle firing and if there is altered muscle firing it is going to lead to development and progression of knee oa because the load dissipation won't be proper there will be excessive load that will be transmitted or transferred to the joint and hence it can lead to further damage of the joint so now if we see over here we have oarsi guidelines uh which recommend the you uh the core uh recommendation level for uh treatment of knee osteoarthritis being as we see over here is arthritis education structured land-based exercise programs that is strengthening cardio balance training or neuromuscular exercises so the type 1 exercise programs in corp they have incorporated the neuromuscular exercise as the exercise treatment in managing patients with knee osteoarthritis as a core treatment program so we'll be seeing what it is and what all do we do in this neuromuscular training program okay so now neuromuscular training is based on the biomechanical and uh, neuromuscular principles so basically if we talk about neuromuscular control and uh, training the neuromuscular control so neuromuscular control is nothing but unconscious activation of the dynamic restraints 
basically there is unconscious activation of the uh, dynamic muscle groups or the restraints that are going to help provide the functional stability during the movement so basically what we target is on sensory motor control and functional stability so what is sensory motor control so sensory motor control is nothing but ability of the joint to perform controlled movement how by performing the coordinated muscle activity so if there is coordinated muscle activity we are going to have controlled so there is going to be controlled uh, joint movement that is nothing but sensory motor control so basically from our sensory input we are going to get a motor output now this control is called as sensory motor control now there is functional stability so what is the functional stability it is nothing but ability of the joint to remain stable when we are performing the dynamic motions so as we can see over here in this figure say for example this person has to rotate the rod from starting location to the target and there are two motions which require upper arm rotation and lower arm rotation as the figure mentions so to perform this particular movement you need good amount of sensory motor control that is coordinated muscle activity is required from your shoulder musculature from your elbow and from your wrist musculature and this coordinated muscle activity is going to control the joint movement and provide functional stability okay so we'll see further what do we do in neuromuscular training and what are the basic principles of neuromuscular training so there are four principles of neuromuscular training so the first one is active movement in synergies so basically if we see over here the example of step up step down is one of the exercise that we give in neuromuscular training so it incorporates active movement in synergies so say there is active movement of all the uh, joints that is your hip knee and ankle in synergy so why are we involving is that is to resemble these movements to the actual life movements that we perform uh, that is in our daily uh, activities so say step up step down is our basic daily life movement so training that is going to be a major principle of neuromuscular training second is bilateral transfer effects of motor learning so basically even if we uh, work on the uh, uninjured limb it's going to cause the bilateral transfer effects to the injured limb third is working in closed kinetic chains so now the exercises where, which we do in neuromuscular training few of them are performed in closed kinetic chain why is that is to improve the sensory motor control okay that is one second is when we perform the exercises in closed kinetic chain it actually helps in evenly distributing the articular surface pressure by muscular coactivation so with closed kinetic chain we are going to cause muscular coactivation and this muscular coactivation is going to help in dissipating or evenly distributing the articular surface pressure okay and fourth is provocation of postural reactions that is the feed for role uh, of the sensory motor system so these are the basic four neuromuscular training principles now neuromuscular training program is basically individualized so this program is individualized because uh, the signs and symptoms or the functional limitations uh, that a person uh, has are heterogeneous those are heterogeneous to the person also or to the injury or to the disease so uh, making it simple we cannot uh, give same uh, protocol or level of 
for exercise to every each and every individual because the amount of muscular activation or the strength or the proprioceptive deficit or the advancement of the disease whether the person is grade one grade two grade three or grade four is going to decide whether you are going to uh, uh, place the person in which level of program or which kind of exercises are to be given so hence the neuromuscular training program is individualized it uh, focuses on several aspects of sensory motor function that is strength coordination balance and proprioception now not uh, necessary that all the exercises in the neuromuscular training program are going to uh, are going to target all of these together say one uh, one exercise focuses on strength another focuses on coordination another balance and another proprioception now there are three levels of each exercise uh, of neuromuscular uh, of in the neuromuscular training program which we'll be seeing further and this progression is guided by the sensory motor function that is nothing but we focus on the quality of the movement so basically the progression of the exercises is only done when uh, the therapist the training therapist uh, knows that the quality of the movement has improved then we go with the further progression of the exercises uh, so quality of the movement will depend on the proper mechanics of the joint so movement performed with proper mechanics of the joint movement performed with proper control also movement performed even if the velocity speed range or the resistance increases the movement is well controlled okay so now let's see what is there in the exercise program so neuromuscular training exercise program incorporates warm up for 10 minutes so the uh, so we go with the uh, cycle ergometer or we can go with treadmill for 10 minutes then we further progress to the exercise program which incorporates the circuit program so after warming up of the tissues we go to the circuit program immediately so it incorporates the three levels of exercise program so let's see the first one the exercise that we incorporate is the postural control exercises basically as we all know that the proximal stability is important for the distal mobility so working on the proximal stability we work on our proximal muscles that is our core and hip musculature so working on that we begin with pelvic lifts working on gluteus maximus muscle and core so what we begin with is for level one both the legs are placed on the ball uh, so ball is closer to the uh, ball uh, ball is closer to the proximal segments and then we ask the person to bridge in second level the ball is more distally placed increasing the challenge of the exercise and in third we uh, off uh, so we go with the single leg uh, bridging or single leg pelvic lift uh, challenging the exercise more then uh, we go with the sit-ups so in sit-ups again with uh, level three of abdominal uh, uh, grade uh, or strength so beginning with that the ball is always placed closer the hip and knee are very well uh, sorry the knees are very well stabilized on the ball so we begin with uh, hands so we begin with the hands uh, that is uh, straight elbow shoulder straight then going to uh, arms across the chest and then arms uh, like the hands above head so increasing the level of difficulty of the exercise second involves postural orientation which involves the sliding exercise so basically what happens is in this we are trying to improve the postural control of the lower extremity so basically why do we call it as postural orientation is because whenever we are going to perform this slide exercise that is going either backwards forwards or uh, uh, sideways what we usually do is ask the person to maintain the proper joint mechanics of the lower limb so basically uh, a cue that we give to a person is maintaining knee joint 
uh, straight that is forwards. So maintaining it, uh, aligning it to the direction of the second toe and not le letting the knee cross the uh, ankle joint while performing this exercise. So the person will go to the range. Uh, so the person will perform the exercise to the range where the knee is not crossing the joint one. Uh, ankle joint number two is knee is facing anteriorly that is towards the second toe and with no pain and no discomfort so level one begin uh, with support so going backwards and sideways also we need to maintain the uh, hip uh, alignment that is when going sideways the hip is not to be brought forwards or backwards so pelvis control is important then in level two, we begin with uh, placing a foam or a soft pillow uh, beneath the foot. Again, this is done with the help of support and we slide a, a small towel uh, backwards and sideways. And third exercise actually involves the forward lunge and side lunge um, that we perform with. Uh, so this is the uh, third level with challenges are postural orientation. Then it uh, it involves lower extremity muscle strength. So basically in first two, so in postural control, we were targeting our, uh, co uh, our coordination. In second, we were targeting our proprioception and balance. In third, we are targeting the muscle strength. So in muscle strength, where we work on uh, strengthening the quadriceps mus musculature are uh, hamstrings that is knee flexion or knee curls that we perform and hip abduction and adduction is performed so basically uh, the progression of this uh, lower extremity muscle strength is either with placing the band from proximal to distal or uh, also the progression could be either changing the uh, resistance maintaining the uh, uh, placing of the band in same fashion for all three levels. Then we have fourth is uh, functional exercises. So basically the major goal of neuromuscular training is to obtain the equilibrium of the loaded segments in both the static and dynamic situations of daily life. So now if we see the sit to stand and step up and step down are the uh, conditions of daily life uh, so those are the activities of daily life and to improve those activities of daily life what we do is we actually make the patient perform sit to stand and step up step down now this is done with uh, proper biomechanical alignment uh, when instructing the patient so it begins with level one with hand support uh, for sit to stand. Level two is arms across the chest and performing sit to stand. And third begins with placing one foot forward and backward, moving more towards single joint, uh, like placing more load on the uh, unilateral extremity and challenging this exercise. And second is step up, step down, where we go on increasing the height of the step where we are performing step up step down so again we uh, focus uh, emphasis is on the efficiency and the quality of movement that we perform with each exercise so last we go with cool down 10 minutes so we go with walking forwards and backwards or we incorporate the lower extra stretching where we incorporate stretching of rectus femoris or quadriceps musculature, hamstrings and uh, calf muscles. So uh, this is the overview of basic uh, neuromuscular training program and what do we do? So we saw that we basically work on the neuromuscular training principles. So in patients with knee osteoarthritis, not only working on the strength aspect is important, but also on the other aspects of sensory motor function, that is coordination, balance, and proprioception is equally important. So whenever we prescribe a, a exercise program to the knee osteoarthritis, we must take into the consideration for 
all the aspects and then uh, give a individualized approach to the patients. So, uh, so this is the link for the neuromuscular training research that we had performed uh, last uh, year. So we tried to see the effects of neuromuscular training on pain function and balance in patients with knee osteoarthritis, where we could find the effect on pain being clinically uh, significant, but there was uh, but there was similar effect between function and balance. Uh, uh, found in both institutionalized training program versus NMT. But overall, if the effect was seen, the neuromuscular training program helped in improving all the three parameters compared to the institutionalized treatment program. Uh, basically, the origin of neuromuscular training program began with uh, uh, the hypothesis that uh, uh, in patients with ACL injuries, uh, there are neuromuscular deficits. Similarly, they found out that in patients with knee osteoarthritis, we also have neuromuscular deficits. So uh, the first program was run by Eva Ageberg and Annie Link et al. in 2010. And they checked the feasibility of these neuromuscular training programs in patients with severe hip or knee OA. Then further, they uh, gave the guidelines, the principles of neuromuscular uh, exercise training program. And this is how uh, the neuromuscular training program is uh, given and is carried out in different countries. Uh, so these are the different research articles which you can go through. And you can uh, see there are different uh, neuromuscular training programs such as there are few programs which will only focus on agility and balance but uh, if we are going to treat the patient so we should incorporate all the parameters of sensory motor function all the aspects of sensory motor function while giving the neuromuscular training program so this was the uh, uh, about neuromuscular training program and uh, yeah thank you that was an amazing session um, for a therapist to incorporate in their patients with osteoarthritis. Thank you so much, Dr. Sajri, for this session. I am definitely hopeful that our viewers are going to benefit a lot from this. So I think we'll end our session here. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you so much.